one other thing that was chatted by Alden Woods. Do we have an Alden Woods in the house? Dan. Okay, that's you. Um, mm -hmm. Super. So we've got something for Dan, something for Emmanuel, and then I see Merchant Nations. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Oh, I, you're I, awesome. I was looking at something else. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to cover today or anything you needed help with? A few weeks ago, I was asking about using API calls for a WordPress project that we're going to tie into the project that we're working on. So if that's still open, we can talk about it maybe. We'll, would love, yeah, would love to add it to the list. Okay. API calls on WordPress set. Okay. Awesome. Will do. And then Senna, I see you join the call. Welcome. Yep. Hey, Senna. Hey. How's how's the learning and building going? Um, I was uh, on service, so it stopped quite a bit. And then now I'm stuck again. <laughs> that, that's right. You're an actual doctor that's probably got other stuff to do. <laughs> Not that this isn't fun. I do uh, when when it works or when yeah. I it's always worse. Yeah. 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 I still think that's so awesome that you're doing that. Um, great. Well, I think that makes up a good call today. Um, I'll just do a real quick intro. Josh and I from Builder here to uh, help you with stuff in your projects. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. This session is recorded. So it, you don't have to take notes if you need to refer to something. Um, and I can also pause the recording at any point if you're like, I don't I don't want it recorded. Um, that's good. And then if you need it after, you can just let me know and I can send it to you. Um, okay, so let's see. What order should we start in, Josh? I'm good with any order. Any order? Okay, let's do what we had uh, on the agenda Discord first, which is going to be um, Dan. Cool. I think it's be question. Hey, everybody. Hey there. Custom job. So, yeah, so let me share my screen here. Perfect. All right. So, um, so I have this up uh, button click right here. So on this button click, I am doing uh, this flow, mm -hmm. and the flow uh, does a little scrape. Uh, and that's an action I created okay. um, with some JavaScript and. I was having problems with the, I guess there's some extra code you're supposed to put in there to help with waiting. I'm not sure if that, that all works or whatever, um, but I didn't, I wasn't able to get that to work. It couldn't find the function for that. that I did that a while ago, so I don't remember too well. Um, yes. And, uh, oh, dang, maybe that was actually it right there. But, um, and then I go through, yeah, go yeah. ahead. No, yeah, so there's if it's a weight issue, there's a chance it's that, or if it's custom JS, it might be something where we use a different action that um, uh, does something on success instead of that. So then it, it, it basically will guarantee that it's after in that way too. But we can come back to that. But I think given the okay. whole scope will be good first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have this, uh, this scrape, and the scrape has a flow that runs on success. Yep. And that, so once it does the scrape, then it sets all these variables and calculates. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the one that we're really interested in is this um, integer that gets created here. So this is the number of results. And let's I'll give you a little context here. I, I'm working just on my laptop screen and I'm like having so much trouble moving things around. But so anyhow, so this is the, can you see this page? My LinkedIn page? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, let's see if I can, I just gotta keep moving things here. Um, so I'm taking this value here of this whole result, and then I'm parsing it out just to get this integer. And that's that's the number I'm trying to push into my JavaScript, okay? And so let's take a look at that again. Um, so after I, uh, I run all 
this stuff to get this integer and I push it into this variable num li results integer. Yep. So that that uh, that gets pushed in and then I want to process that with this JavaScript. So a little log saying I'm running JavaScript and here it is. Now I did try some timeout kind of things to slow it down and I yeah. had some mi mild success with that, but we we can lightly take care of if 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 everything's working that you just showed and it's simply a matter of like timing issue, we can likely take care of it pretty quickly. Um, oh, well, that's great. And ultimately, the big thing it will come down to is that you can't whenever you do that on success, that weight um, that you have. If we go if you go one flow backwards, like the very first flow that you showed us. Um, that weight that you have there is not waiting for that entire on success thread to complete. It's only okay. waiting for the first action to complete. So as soon as it moves on from there, it's proceeding down this. And so the reality is the right way to do this to guarantee that the other success thread has already completed is to put all of the rest of the actions that need to happen afterwards on, at the end of that other one that you, that you end up on. Okay, so we get rid of this. Well, we don't want to get and, rid of it. We, I think we want I mean, to but we're gonna we're gonna nest it under here, right? No. Uh it's oh. the opposite of what you're doing here. So what we want is well that actually could work, but I prefer doing it the way I'm gonna show you here. Okay. Uh, mostly because of the the way I'm gonna do it will guarantee you like the the predictability of the availability of the variables will be done. Um, okay. I could still see some random issues on the weight if we did it this way. So I would keep your success flow that you have, wh whatever we had there a second ago. Okay. Just give me a second. Cause I literally, my <laughs> brain is not working. I can't remember what it was called. Um, uh, I've changed his names too many times trying to, oh, you know, it'll be easier if I call it this anyhow. Yeah. Um, give me a second. Um, oh boy. Um, here. Okay. Okay. So what I'm saying is our actions here, like action three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, I would want all of those probably in an additional like flow. Um, okay. And then like, all the way down the rest of this, and then. And then if you click into show LI users results number. Okay. So if you click into this, at the very end of this is we would nest that new additional flow that we're creating. So we would guarantee that all of this is done before we go on to the end to the rest of the things in that previous previous flow. Okay. So how do we do how do we do that? So you would have to we the way I would do it is I would create a new flow and I'd call okay. it the, like the, it's like the end of this thing that we're doing. So all we're doing is new flow. We can, it's going to be like, I think it looks like it's like the last flow that we're going to run. So I would just call it messaging. I, I don't know what to call it, but exactly what's happening. But Okay, what um, reason we would just call it the end of this thing that we're doing right now is what yeah. I would... <laughs> that's this thing. Okay, I'll remember that one. Uh, Anyhow, um get there. so create the flow. Now go back to our okay. original one. Okay. Very yeah. one. And so again, what we want to do, like literally like number three, I want to copy numbers like action number three, and I want to paste it into the other one. Okay. And you're gonna have to do that for all. Actually, another way you you could do it that way. Actually, here's what here's what we should do instead. Let's actually okay. just go to this flow, and uh, the on the left hand side, go okay. find this flow, whichever one we're on. If you scroll up and down, oh, it'll be oh it'll, the one we're on here. Yeah, it'll be highlighted. It's a pre. Oh. If you just scroll up, you'll find it because it's a, it's got a highlighted thing on it. There it is, down. There it is. Yeah. Just clone this. Okay. Just duplicate this. And then uh, rename it the like, messaging end, or is what I would do. Uh, perfect. 
Now delete actions one and two. Okay. And now uh, we need to go go back to the first one, the original one. So the one right above this on the left hand side. Okay, yeah, yeah, that works. Now in theory, what we want to do is we would delete three, four, five, six all the way down. Delete three, four, five, six. Okay. So three, uh, three again, right? <laughs> so we're just deleting everything that happened after the successful that you want to be running. Like you want okay. that success flow to be completed. And so. Understood. Yeah, I, I get that. Okay. Okay, so I didn't, yeah, so I was like order of operations, I was always unclear and I just would experiment until it worked. Yeah. Okay. And so now so, the final thing is we want to go to your success one. So let's go scroll down on the right hand side. Click into this one. Uh, scroll down. All the way down. And just go ahead and add the nest. And then we want to nest the new one, the pre iterate root connection message end. And then add a wait before it and there. And so now we're guaranteeing everything that needed to happen after the success is going to happen after all of this is completed. Okay. Should I give it a test? Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, I don't need that many results. Hold on. Okay. And I'm looking. Oh, yeah. So, just what I was looking at here is my console log. And yeah, so. It, um, so yeah, this is what was not working. So that's working now. So um, I'm not sure why I got a blank here, but that's probably something else. But yeah. so this if, is. If you had a, go ahead. If you had a previous blank. Like it it could be like some additional adjustments based off the sequencing of things now. However, yeah, right. Um, if you just go through like mechanically through like the, the rest of the flow, if something's breaking and you just see like where that might be, like it'll probably be just something similar to, to fix or change from like, like what we just did. Okay, let me just peek at this. It should give a much better. Yeah, so here we go. This is building properly. That's great. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was really helpful. So the, the quick like and now I understand. Yeah. Yeah, the quick summary lesson for me there is wait. Uh, fundamentally, the best way to view wait is the action itself that is there. You can guarantee that that action itself will be done before it goes down the rest of the thread. However, if that action has unsuccess branches or logic that go to other flows, the wait in and of itself will not guarantee that all of those downstream flows will finish before it goes to the next action. Um, We'll probably be adjusting the way the threading works in the future to make that a little easier to build with. However, that's the thing to note is wait will make sure that action itself is completed. It won't guarantee potentially all the downstream things from it are completed. Okay, now is that true also of things like uh, like loot or the time start? Is that, how does, how does that, so time uh, start? Uh, it depends on how you're using it. I mean, the time start action would, like if I use a start timer action and then I have like a wait and then something right after it, as soon as like the timer trigger action is completed, it's it's going to go run the next action. The way that, and then like just whenever that rule was set for the other timer to, to trigger a flow, that, be, that becomes independent. It becomes a separate thread at that point that just gets triggered in like a second or whatever that might be. And so, and if then works, similarly as well it, yeah. it's a new it's a flow that's no longer tied to the weight correct yeah so if you do if then branch 
and they both run like a, let's say you have the simplest version, like if this is true, set variable to yes, if this is true, no, set variable to no, let's say it's that. Uh, and you have a wait after the if then action. While it might not be an issue in most scenarios, you can't technically guarantee that the next set variable actions will have been set in those follow-up flows. So the most proper way would be to set the downstream next step actions nested inside of each of those success flows too. Yeah, uh, so that makes sense. So basically all these loops should actually, any, any sort of flow that happens outside of the initial thing should really be the last thing in a flow if, if, it, it, if, if it's, it's a relying weight. on information or something happening prior to it, you should try and make it, group it together and then nest it in, in all the branches. Excellent. That's the way I would recommend doing it. Uh, and when we bring some of the flow stuff we're doing to the front end too, uh, this will be a lot easier to visualize and, and also execute. So, Well, I appreciate all that help. That, that's uh, been a big problem I've had because this is all about workflow. The scraping. It's good yeah. to know the rules. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. And thank you, Josh. That was awesome. Good, good lesson there. All right. So next up, Emmanuel. Are you ready to go through your questions? Let's do it. Just you're still muted. Yep, got it now. Can you see? We can. Yes. Awesome. All right. Um, quick context, I'm trying to create like a mini CMS for a music album site. Uh, so the idea would be you click on albums, you get the list, you click on the item, you get the details. You can add, create, save the updates. Nothing strange there. Um, I've just done the, the layout yesterday, so I haven't done all the functionality yet, but Maybe I'll just have you guys put me in the right direction on that. I think the, the three things I had done was one, I noticed with this, so I've done the nav bar to mm -hmm. show for 100 dVH, so the, the displayed vertical mm -hmm. height. But I've noticed that if I, okay. if I make the page too long, it doesn't actually fill the height like it does when it's short. So yeah. how do I lock this in place? Um, so 100 dBH, gotcha. Okay. Uh, so they're really just CSS questions here fundamentally. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. They're all CSS. The, uh, um, the real thing, so one, one, 100 dBH is taking like the height of the browser window that you're in. And so when you scroll past it, it's why it's not there. Um, and so the biggest thing we want to do is probably just make it fixed to that position. So it's position um its position is fixed and then it's just uh probably top zero left zero uh and sure. that should be doing it and there could be some variance in that that i could imagine but that should be probably take care of it i believe can you show me how this is positioned right now yeah so let me see if i can zoom a little bit more yeah and then I, is it i don't know if i'm am i zoomed in weird or Oh yeah, I'm zooming in. Okay, cool. So we've got our component here. Yep. Yep. And then can you show me the left? Okay. So position, display flex column space between. So let's do position fixed. On this, on the this piece. I, I think we can start here. Yeah. There, there might be a reason to do this on actually at like the layer above this as opposed to okay. here, but uh, I think we can start here. So every time I do that, I lose color. <laughs> That's um, so. What did you just do? Actually, you you made a fix. You go to top zero. So that's because what I want to see is like how that looks then actually in execution, as opposed to in the studio preview here. Sure. Um, to take a look. Well, there's not there. It's not okay. So it's not actually taking space now. I I think. Um, yeah. So 
I mean, it back. could be because I have the this as a two column. Yeah, thing. that's like part of the it, it's because the, there's always like a few different ways to set these types of things up. And so um, unraveling that is the main thing. Can you go to the column that you have here? The columns two. The yes, columns two. Right above this. So display flex, flex row. Can you click on columns two utility class? I want to see how the left nav is getting its size. Nope, in, in the utility class above it. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then if you can go to all props real quick or, or awesome. yeah, that works. So there's nothing, there's nothing assigned here. All right, now uh, click on left nav. Um, 100th EDH. And so there's nothing giving it its defined width here. No. Um, and then click on main body uh, forms. So I could, okay. So, the, so you're saying I could okay. set the width here. You could set the width there, or you can set it at the column, which I probably am going to recommend the column, um, the columns level. But I I want to see how your main body is set first before I, I say that. And the main body. Is this display block? So like those, okay. Um, and then can you can you go to the page that is the menu option? I think. There yeah. We um, click back on it. Okay, and then click on the that div again. Okay, so let's remove the uh, remove the position fixed. Um, the I'm trying to think the easiest way to do this without potentially messing up a a bunch of stuff because because part of the part of the reason I'm thinking through here right now is also like how does this perform on mobile is like like responsively once it gets small because it influences how to go about doing this exact thing um, yeah. like. Specifically, like if, if you load this on a phone, like what do you want this sidebar to look like? I can tell you that the best like example with a lot of stuff built around it is the done template. I, I in the in the actual application, it uses a left hand sidebar um, yeah. that like like on hover expands and shows you the menu options, or on um, or when it's collapsed, collapse mobile, it like it slides off with like a menu option to like open it or, or close it. And so like yeah. one of the it just there's a lot to explain to like hit through all of like the that setup but ultimately um what it's going to be is like on the parent the the columns div two i that's where i give the columns its sizing and so i i say like uh the grid template columns i think is the css property and so yep. like on like full width desktop or like let's say over the the mobile pixel width i typically will say um like a, let's say let's say this is 100 pixels, so it'd be 100 pixels auto, and so automatically, um, what should happen is the left column takes up 100 pixels, the middle one takes up the rest of the screen that's available to it, um, right? And then vice versa, um, whenever you go under or not vice versa, but then but then responsibly whenever you go under uh, that, what you might do is say zero pixels, um, and then auto, and then or it's probably not zero pixels then it's actually it, it could be more pixels still but what you actually will end up doing is trans translating the menu option left on the screen with with like a with css translate trans or transform translate x minus 100 percent um for the move yep because it'll move it over and then whenever you either whether it's hover or whether it's like on click to expand it you move it over um okay so, I, my only well, that's in the, done, in the done template. Yep, the done template. If you go into the actual app area, is where you'll see all the all the stuff around. You'll see there's a couple of flows that are relevant related to it, but mostly it's CSS. Um, yeah. And that's the hesitation with saying go do this, is because there is just a lot of little details I think to do it like the perfect sure. way. And that template basically has it all done. So the, no. what what I had done to achieve a similar effect is. With the the tables here, I put this, and if you click it, 
it yep. shows three other things instead. And the whole point with the, the DVH was so that no matter what size, if it's on a mobile browser, it would always fit the left nav in that kind of, of way. Yeah. Um, and I, I, for the, the other part, if you do position like, say that again, actually is what's scrolling. And so actually this part of the solution there could just be telling the body, let, let's see if we can solve it this way. Let's go back to our parent. Um, for the body or for the the main the, the main outside page there we page. go yep. uh, click on the columns the, the two columns uh thing uh, yep. click on line styling here and do you overflow hidden on which one on two columns on this one that you're on right now yep, yep. overflow hidden let's see what happens there by default because what i i'm considering is What's happening is your your page body is actually scrolling here, and that's not what we want to scroll. What we actually want to scroll is just the middle content. Um, yeah. And so this add a like, go to column main body now. Column main body. Yep. And do overflow set to auto. And then let's see if this makes a difference because what we should see now is our left nav column shouldn't be allowed to scroll. And the only thing that will okay. be will then be the middle content. This is that's more like direct to like your question. Although like again, like even this should be done, I think, in consideration of the rest. Mm, no, so that's still scrolling. So what's what's scroll the page is still scrolling then. Um yeah. so then so then alternatively, if I can lock the main thing and then put the scrolling on the on this component where I yeah. can get a scroll bar effect. Yeah. On it, so the, I wouldn't think it, the easiest way will be to manage the, the scrolling not on the component, but on the on the, the main page. <laughs> The thing on the left on the main page, yeah. um, and then really what actually you might need to put no scroll overflow to to no, to to none on the body as well, because it's actually like the page body is still scrolling here, but not not here. So in the actual yeah, page yeah. of the whole thing, got it on this thing. No no no, we're back where you were. Click. Uh huh. On click on the page body at the very top of this. Oh, the page body, and then go to styling. The page body is like the on the at the actual page level. Yeah, yeah. And then on the element styles, click here, and then you overflow none here. Overflow none. Or do a, mm -hmm. sorry, overflow uh, hidden. No, there we And because now we should, should definitely not be scrolling. Mm -hmm. There might be a different spot where we have to add like, uh, Um, Let me take a look at then, and uh, if not, I'll I'll cry back out. Um, okay. New topic. Yeah. Um, okay. New topic. There's a there's a couple little things to try, and again, even just part of my advice will be dependent on how you want it to work responsively overall too. And I think if you look sure. at them, you can get a feel for how okay. you want. Hey, real yeah, quick. Yeah. So I have this set up exactly like he wants for the Huda admin panel. Okay. Emmanuel, I will send you exactly what you want to do because it's really e easy to achieve if you just put it in a grid and you name okay. your left side and you name your body and then yeah. it'll work like a dream. So Perfect. I'll, I'll Thank, you. You. Thank you. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thanks for offering up, Kyle. That's great.
Um, I trust anything Kyle says when it comes to styling or in the best way to do something because everything he does um, feels so good, looks so good. Um, um, Emmanuel, did you have something else before we um, move yes, on? Yes, I did. A quick one. So the one that actually we shot on Discord about. So what I was trying to do is I was trying to see if I can set up my form to have this kind of cool as you type the label moves um, above the feel so that I don't have all that feel noise stuff. And what it was requiring was making a, a I guess this is a class that mm -hmm. has yep. this kind of stuff with a tilde and all of that in there. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do, where would that be? That'd be on one of these forms. What I tried to do was to put it on the input label, trying to create a state thinking that's how I would do it. Mm. But when I did, like I couldn't, so assuming it would start from not. Yep. So you'll you'll need to. This is how you'll do it. Uh, and the biggest thing will be you'll have to change it in a second in in a nested spot. So if you just create this one, if you want to start with okay. it. Okay. Uh, and the, the the best rule of thumb here, use this as like a label as opposed to like the actual CSS. Actual thing. I was Think thinking of it about the label versus the actual CSS because I'll we'll show you. Um, and now right. click on that. And so now double click this thing. Double click the selector. Yes. Uh, so this is where you'll put all of that, the that CSS stuff. Okay, 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 okay. And then if you know, like, like do you know how, how like the, like uh, HTML targeting and all that kind of stuff works with it? Because, no. so it'll, like it looked like some of the things on what you just had pulled up was targeting via. Um, so it's like input on folk, not on focus, invalid input group error. So like, I don't exactly know what's going on here, but ultimately some of these things will, might be targeting like another. Yeah, I think the, the yeah. there was an easier one. Let me see if I can find that image. All right, so like this one might be a bit easier to, where is it? The, the easiest way for sure is gonna be like creating all the classes exactly, and then you'll end up using uh, input, not placeholder shown. Let's see, I don't okay. yeah. know. And then label is a different class, right? Because it's up here. So it's a, it's a, it's saying if it, if the placeholder is not shown in input, then do this to the label or something like that. Or if label appears after an input yeah. and the placeholder is not shown, then execute this. So the only thing I don't know is like what's the the label here? The label is is this little thing. Right, but what's the like it label is uh, applied to is like a div inside of Dorian would know this exactly. <laughs> this is right, like this gets into like a type of like uh, element and CSS targeting that yep. is really, really detailed. And you can do it this way, it's just a matter of oh, thank you. just okay because the, the, the alternative to doing it all this way in CSS is instead you do it in actions where it's like on focus or on lack of focus, check to see if like the length of the content is zero. And then if it isn't, then uh, then, uh, then change the label location with a flow as opposed to all doing it in CSS. In I think, the CSS. Yeah, I think when, and you'll, you'll still use like CSS classes for like labels and things like, uh, or for like changing the look of it and repositioning it. But yep. that's the, the, the main difference uh, here. Okay. I guess is that the when we get into redoing um, some of these types of inputs and add more functionality in them, we'll we'll mask some of that difficulty. But okay, but I, but I think that also the, be a, you copied and sent this. I'm sure in Discord or something. I'm sure he'd be happy to look at it and tell you what 
what he thinks the styles should be or how you need to write it. Yeah. Um, but thanks for showing me how to open that selector thing. Cause I think I was trying to figure out how to, I to keep do. seeing a lot of these things online and I was like, okay, I can just. Yeah. If you do figure like, out nested selectors is definitely something that's not like very apparent uh, and okay. how to do now, mostly cause it is a more advanced thing. Like a lot of people don't get into that type of stuff and it does take something as specific as this to make it valuable. Um, yep. So you're, the two ways to do it are you can do it via selectors like you see here in the selector detail, or you can do it with a flow by like manually changing, the, like adding a utility class or something like that. Okay. All right. And then I think the last one though is a, is a basic, it's a basic, if I click on a record, it pulls up stuff out of a collection, which I think which video or template is the best one to, to look at for that? Uh, so you click on that and it pulls up like a list beneath it with- like... Yeah, so like over here, when I click an album, I want all the information on the album to appear here. Okay. And uh, it's already in the collection. So you're, okay, oh, so, you, so from, it's a select menu. You select an Correct. album, you, and so you're good with that part all the way through. Like how to select the album? Yeah. Okay. Right. So we select it, and then this is the page where you don't have that figured out. Like, Correct. Like, you should be seeing stuff about this album right now? Yes. So can you show us the flow by which, when you clicked that previous thing, that opened yeah. this page? Um, so when I click on right there, yeah, this item, yep, it would then. Right now, it's just opening the the frame. I haven't put in the logic to pull the current record stuff. Okay, well, it, so it should already it is pulling the current. So this the page that is opening is opening with the record of this album. So if you okay. go to page binding now on that page, the the actual thing that's being opened. Yes. So all your page binding should work. So if you just click on like that top input. So I haven't bounded yet. Yep. So if you do data from record value. From build, no. Okay. So there, this one. So data, data, data. There we go. From record value. Yep. Choose from the field, from a field. Yep. You choose your album collection. I'm assuming it was albums, but whatever that yeah, collection. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm on my, I'm on South Africa speed here. It's taking a bit to show up. Can you click on away from the data tab and go back? I mean, you'll try oh, there that. We go. Oh, there okay. you go. Yeah, it just takes a while. I assume, I assume the, the Azure South Africa Cape Town nodes haven't been activated yet. That's um, and then this would be the next will speed some of these things up. I was just talking to uh, the guys getting an update. So at least the studio will be faster for this. Perfect. Yeah, definitely making some changes that are going to help this. So that, that now will, should automatically open and put the title of the album into that. In Okay, because if, if that's all to it, then that's easy enough. The last thing I'll ask is the to build the action to update the record. If I make changes in there, is that simply just update? There's a couple. Uh, the easiest one will just be using autosave, which you can trigger on yes. the change. Uh, all right, drum roll. Nah. And, oh, but maybe. I need to bind it. No, uh, no. Can you just go to the flows for me? Just On watch. the page, I don't think I'm loading page binding current record or anything. I need a page load. Click on page page binding. Yeah, it, that's all automatic. So it looks like that should be okay. triggering. Um, uh, now, now to be clear. What when I click on the album, I don't know if it matters. When I click on this, it's loading this up here, which is two is the same thing, a two column component component. 
split. And then within that, I have this. That definitely makes a difference depending on what you're doing exactly. So you're opening frame album form first, or you're opening the drop down. No, so so I open frame album form. Oh, I see. So and then in frame album form, I have a nav and then the the actual form associated it. with this. So okay, yeah, I see what's going on, I think. So uh one I would I see what you're doing here. Um, the the key thing that's going to be happening is instead of nesting um, like that page actively on it. So like just even though that's where you're going to open this into, take that page out. Yep. Of okay. Because right now that page is loading and it's just loading because it's told to be in that component, but it's not being given the record. But, so you need to go. You need to go back. You're good there. We need to go back to the page we were just on, and just click on that component. Yep. and remove the page. Remove the page. Oh, 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 just select nothing. Yep. Okay, now let's go to pay in the page load flow. In the page load flow, yep. Click on page load, and you open page in, into container. Is It's an action. Yep. Um, that one right there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So the, the big thing to think about is the concept to master here, will, which will make this all more obvious is the way that records get passed through the tables or in the pages. And so although that last one, we open this page with the record of it, that page that's nested in this component is not being opened with that record. In the Got page. it. So I, get, I need to pass it forward. Pass it forward, exactly. So we're going to choose that page. We're going to choose the container on this page. It's the page to um, open. It would be this one. Okay. Form, form description, yep. Description. Uh, Current page. And choose the, that container, yep. And, form and then we're just going to the record context. We're going to also do current record. Current record, OK. But now we've. Sense. We open this, the, the top level page is open from the, the list, the, the one that you click. And then this page gets opened from this one. Put up, go ahead and put up. Um, yeah. It shouldn't technically matter, but uh, it's it can't hurt. All right, let's see if we got a loop. Boom. 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 Yep. Bingo. Excellent. So that's definitely what it is. And I think based off what you showed us is probably how I would do, I might do it too. There's, there's worlds in which you might decide how to structure do like, yeah. like, it could all be one page. It could be done in a variety of ways, but this is, this one make, does make sense for sure. Okay. And then for the, the, if I make changes and I want to save it, yep, just there's an action. Click on the input that we added this to, just the input album title on the left hand oh, side. Right, you said auto save. Yep. Go to events and do auto change event and then just choose auto save, the very top one. Nope. Right below that. The select change event. Auto save. Auto save. So what auto save oh. does is uh, whenever it's triggered from, a change it from an event on a specific element, and that specific element is done with data binding. Yep. Save knows I just want to resave this thing that's being bound to that, and so it just automatically okay. does it. So that's the easiest way to do it in this case. Um, you could get more complicated if you needed to, like if you were saving more records at once. You could do just an. Uh, you could just do a the traditional. Builder update data action, and then you're just right. doing an update record. But this is the way that you should do it here for sure. Okay, and then obviously the only risk possible is in the event of needing to undo, because we're not. And if you want to hand it on you, you just have to build a way to do that, which would be. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. 
old value somewhere. Yeah. You have yeah. to save the value and the new value. Okay. Yeah. So I expect now this one up here would have saved. Yeah. So if I go back to the other app, it should. And excellent. All right. That gives me enough to keep busy till next week. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. All right, Emmanuel, good to see you. Thanks for letting Josh help you sort some of those out. Um, I would love to call up on Merchant Nations. If you're still around and want to go through API calls on from a WordPress site. Yeah, actually, the main question that I have is like, where in the documentation will I find additional information so I can call the data that we generate and save off of Builder? So that's the main primary one. The second one is how do where's the documentation on how to um create relational um data stream off of the data that we already have. So for example, we currently are playing around with the done uh template and it has all of these data in it. So the data essentially says here's the company name and here's all of the users that are attached to that. So how do we create a, an API call so that I get the company name and all of the users attached to that uh, company? And we've been looking for the documentation and or how to make an API call so that we can use it on one of our pro, uh, plugins in, um, that we are creating for WordPress. The end goal is that we will have several restaurants that we will be creating as the companies, but it's not necessarily limited to restaurants. We only have three restaurants right now for templating. And then uh, there's gonna be um, items or uh, dishes that's gonna be on that. And then employees that's gonna be attached to that restaurant. And it, all of that data will be formatted and shown on the WordPress site. Gotcha. The, yeah, the done template is going to be used as the portal for the owners of the restaurant. And um, essentially, they will be creating the the items and the employees and the time and the schedule. All of that is going to be done on the portal. But most of the information like the, uh, the restaurant menu, the prices, the pictures, all of that is going to be shown on the plugin uh, for, for WordPress. Gotcha. So uh, there's a couple answers. First off, there is not an API access to your builder data as of this moment. Okay. Uh, we have it built and testing and building the UX on top of that right now. But as of this moment, there is not an API structure for you to just go get the data and use it elsewhere the way that you described it there. Um, to, to Based off my understanding of what you said. And so... That's an important thing for sure, just to lead off. Um, there, the follow-up to that um, is one again, is, is what we're building. We don't have like a launch date for it right now, but what you just said will be available in our next update. Um, so that is coming and will be really great, but is, is not here at the moment. Um, so that's one just important thing. Um, there's really two follow-ups to that to, for me. Um, one, depending on your time table and importance and how much you have set up and built at the moment. Uh, and like when you're trying to get launched and everything, using something like a Xano, like this is a prime example of where someone might use something like Xano on top with, paired with Builder, where they're using Xano as the back end and Builder as the front end for the environment, for like the portal. Um, that would be like a thing that people have done in the past for something similar to this. Um, I could see a world where, depending on the way that this WordPress, uh, you said plugin, depending on how that works, there is a world in which I could see it's, it gets a little nuanced, and we I I want to like look at it and learn a bit more about how the, the setup works. But there is a way you could open parts of these in like iframes inside of there that are using component that are using things actually built and hosted in Builder that could potentially accomplish this. I don't know exactly the way, like there's certain like security structures and data that would have to be done properly for that to work, that I don't know exactly how that would work at the moment. <laughs> but that would be yeah. a way to potentially do it now is using iframes for the for the for what's actually shown in WordPress 
Um, there's pros and cons to that though, for sure. Yes, uh, that's the, yeah, the cons part is the one that's uh, breaking almost all of the, the vendors that we're currently using. Like we're using Zaytac and we're using Milky Way and all of that. And the way they're doing it is either it pulls us away from the current WordPress site or it creates like an, uh, uh, yeah, an iframe would be a good uh, example of that. But there's other ways that they do it where they insert the uh, the content of their website and database onto the WordPress um, site. The problem with that is it doesn't keep track of, let's say if I click on an item, it goes to their website, it doesn't go to mine. And that uh, that alone is uh, data that we're losing as far as like the behavior of the customer, especially when we plug it into um, a progressive uh, web app kind of thing, where we lose the uh, what's happening to the site as uh, people interact with the website and the items that they're trying to order, um, mm -hmm. or uh, what the um, what the users are use uh, are doing to the app and or, or the the, uh, the web app itself on the browser type of thing, all of that kind of gets lost, and we kind of value that data because we're more into the interaction with the user rather than what they're doing and how they're doing things. It's more of what is the user doing and how are they doing things uh, type of uh, data collection that we're doing because it's very valuable for our marketing. Uh, we, uh, when we do A-B testing, for example, we lose that um, type of data when we're collecting it. Um, how far do they have to scroll? Where is Where did they uh, click? Is it on the upper right, lo lower right kind of thing? And uh, Google um, Data Analytics loses that val very valuable data for us. Um, meanwhile, with Zeno, uh, is there documentation as far as like connecting all of the data that goes into it, and then and then we create our own uh, API outside of that? Yeah. So Zeno, are you familiar with Zeno at all? I've I've only heard of it. <laughs> so Zeno is exclusively a backend no code tool. They don't mm -hmm. they don't do anything with front ends or anything like that. So they're just purely how do you create your databases and manage anything server-side flow-wise, and then there's also just API endpoints on top of it. So essentially all of their documentation is how to do exactly that. Um, I, with Xano, about a year ago, we built, a, there's a YouTube series of a builder and a builder bot with Xano as the backend. And so I, I actually built a builder, like a, a chat GBT clone, basically. I built one using just builder all the way through. And then with Xano, we did one where we use a Xano backend and the builder front end to show one, how you might just set up something like that in Xano and then how you would integrate that with builder. Uh, and then how you would integrate that with what you're saying in the WordPress side would ultimately just resolve it. It would be a similar way, which is just the appropriate API calls at the right moment, um, just using an API key and then making sure that the, the uh, WordPress plugin that you have is just um, able to where wherever it's getting the information from to reference the correct like company let's say as a starting point to then relationally go into all the data um, and find the and find and then display what you need. Uh, so like other than, I, the builder bot example would be great for us because you can see how it integrates into like what you're building in the portal wise and builder um, from a data perspective. But then the Xano one would show you how to just build the backend and then all the endpoint structure so that you can then use it anywhere that you need to. Cool. Thank you very much. I'm done. Awesome. Yeah. And again, it's where we're building all that right now. <laughs> um, it is definitely an important thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm super excited for a lot of the work, both UX wise and functionality wise are some very big things that is on the way that the whole team is doing. Um, and then I also just chatted, you had asked a question about learning more about relational data and kind of how that works. Um, I just chatted a tutorial that works through like single to many, many to many relationships. Um, so that'll be a good, good one to do. And then this one here that I'm going to chat is the, um, is the action doc for the Xano API call. So it'll kind of walk you through how to set it up um, if you want to do like a little test run for something. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, hey, you bet. Thank uh, you. Okay. So ah, we're actually, we've got three minutes left. Um, Senna, I, I, 
I can hang out for a little bit longer to make sure we at least get through something. Let's do it. Uh, I think I've got enough time for another question too. Um, so Senna, did you want to share anything? Um, I think you had said you, you had a couple things. Um, yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully quick. Um, so basically you guys helped me a lot last time you got me like 80% of the there and then I got like 81% and then I couldn't figure <laughs> out again. So, um, so let me, let me share. Basically the question is fundamentally, I just want to build a, a string sequentially build a string. Okay. So that's it. Um, the, uh, you guys, um, so just, you can see the, this, the correct screen, hopefully mm -hmm. yeah, the, it's got the builder studio and my mouse moving around. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so really quickly, you guys, so from last time we talked about, um, the, there are these symptoms on the screen, um, and each symptom is part of some uh, bigger sort of symptom group. And then based on, I was looking at Kyle's website, it's cool. Um, and then based on the, uh, based on that symptom group, then it will go to this table and then like select an outcome. You had, I'm, I'm trying to do, I think a less, sophisticated version of what I think you were trying to like teach me to do. So, so I, we set up those bigger categories. Um, you walked me through how to do this check for a match thing for this, this one, for the, like this one big category, there were like LUTs, UUTS, STI, non-localizing. Um, I forgot to change the name on that, but the, and then, so basically, so I thought, so, and then you said, so basically set a variable, see if it exists. And if it does, then, um, then it does. And then basically go this if then logic to see if it exists. So basically based on that, so sequentially, I just want to build a string that's like, you know, let's true. It's not zero UUTS true. It's one STI is true is one. And then, then I, this is the, the name is wrong, but it was, um, uh, type of symptoms is it'll be at the bottom and then yeah so this one should be sorry um so and then based on that go to this table this lookup table um that has that's basically this and then and then the additional fields i have it sort of set up the additional fields are just the outcome and then like another field for like additional text like this kind of text here and then the you know, the big, you know, you have this or you likely have this and then here's some expl explanatory text. So um, hopefully I explain that coherently. So yeah, so then I, so, so for this if then logic part, um, I tried to, a bunch of stuff, I tried to use that concatenate thing, didn't work. And then I tried to make a separate low and I just don't know if I'm doing something completely illogical. So I made a, on the page binding, I made a, a variable called lookup code. And then I made these like set bit zero or one things. And I, this is what the function looks mm -hmm. like. Does that, is that logical? Is that the way you'd go around? You're just doing look you're just putting one at the end of lookup code? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I wanted to if it, it starts off as like an well I wanted it to start off as an empty string which I don't think it does and then if yeah if LUTS is true then set a one if it's not true set a zero for one. The first thing. and then add the next does that make sense is that uh it does I, I think so um okay. I'm not a hundred percent certain and I might do this differently either way but um one, so there's a couple of things. One, I think there's a chance that based off how you're doing this, the similar to the first one that we went all the way through, that the timing of it is creating potential issues okay. using the same variable here. I'm not certain of that, but just based off what you showed me, I think it's potentially likely. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. where you might not be getting the expected result because of that. Two, I my main question is where do you where do we know that this is falling? Like where do we know it's correct until and then where do we know that's falling off? is a really important thing to help 
I think pinpoint what to what to focus on because there's a few things I saw there that might be an issue mm -hmm. um, and I think it we it would be good to know like where where we think there's the the first fall off because it'll help me help me focus on it yeah Ult ultimately again what your the goal is to sh to display the correct you're all we're doing here is getting all the correct filters so that when we ever whenever we want to give them a message we're giving them the right message right yeah. So basically I just want, you know, something that's just like zero, 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 give this, you know, look that up, give it a message. And I thought, you know, if I built a string for the lookup thing, then I, that would be an easy way to do it. But, um, so I think this is the first point where it fails and it's where I set the variable because I want an empty string and I did the, just like the, what if I, you want an empty string, you can just do nothing here. Just oh, look, okay. code to nothing. Like that's going to be an empty string. Okay. So it like like in the actual variable data that would be lookup, and then in quotes the value for this in the JSON would just be two quotes and nothing in the middle. That's that's what this is right here. Okay, um, I'm gonna set that. Okay, um, I was putting in it was the string was already like quote symbols. Okay. Yep. Right. So uh, that's the start. Okay. I I guess we're I, I need to see the work like what starts this and then what. What do we get to in the end here? So okay, so the get responses. Can can we actually go back to that very first one? Sure. One thing I'm curious about is uh, so okay, so we have actions one, two, and three here. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about action three. Oh, so oh yeah, good point. So so we're we're using oh, this. Data. This one, I was trying to just see if the string was being built, and I put this little thingy gotcha. at the bottom to, to just. Yeah. So like the first example that we went over, like if all, basically lookup code is being set by number two here, right? Like like downstream of this, like that's where it gets manipulated. <laughs> so one, I guess if it's just a test one, it's fine. But like from a timing perspective, that would not work. Predictable uh, would be the right thing because you're not going to get all the stuff done before this this actually triggers. Um, OK. Something. Um, but so then we so we create the record, which is just the response initially, right? It's just like, hey, like, here's a survey reply. That's no, that's what number one is. E, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it was the from this page, the age, and then the responses as a as an a JSON array, and then the sex as, again, just from the from a page variable. That makes sense. Uh, and so now we click on click on number two now for me. And I know this is where you were sorry, I'm just re-wrapping my head around it. Yeah. So no, no, is, it. we're filtering the repeating list um by present or absent equals one. Mm -hmm. um, starting data set field type or type of symptom equals LUTs. Mm -hmm. Um so what we're doing is is that equal to one? So do we know that this is working, I guess, to start? Like that, this is producing what we expect when we do, when we test it. Good question. I don't know how to find out. How so? What I would do, um, I would create a new flow and just call it like test flow. Okay. And I would copy, uh, and I would just copy this. Actually, before you do that, just copy this action. Oh, just, action just, just hit copy. Yeah. Uh, copy and then it now it's created a new, new flow on the left hand side. Left, uh, right there. Yeah, yeah. It's, we can call it whatever we want. It's just we're just testing. Uh, now let's paste the on the right hand side. Oh, I said all. Yep, yeah, you're good. All the way to the right. Nope. Oh, you're recopying it again. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I said duplicate, not copy. Those. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, you can paste it on the the right, right. There you go. So uh, ultimately, the the thing that we do here is we we set this into a variable, right? Mm -hmm. So let's true is the variable name. So I would run this action, and then console log the variable, or if you want to display it and test out, but you could do it there. We're just going to put the variable into that spot so that we can see what it produced. So just set elements. Yep, set element value.
uh, from variable, second one from the top. Uh, let's true. Uh, and then put a weight between these. Uh, let's go back to the your submit flow. Um, so what I would do, actually, I would just remove check for match. And re re like for now, just mm -hmm. hit remove group uh, and then remove that too. And I would just then nest in the thing that we just created. And uh, we don't need to wait there. So this is my starting point because I want to I want to see what this produces first. Um, because everything is contingent on this working. Okay. Um, I'm going to just make it so that it has to be there. Yeah. So you right. would submit. Okay. Then, Something gets set. So this looks like all of the data. Yes. Um, so what? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, so it looks like curious. Uh, can we go back to the flow? Oh. Really, what we should be getting is if I, if I think of it right, it, the the filtering that we're doing should be basically saying. Um, okay, scroll scroll up, scroll up. So we're saying, give me the data in a repeating list, present or absent, which is the variable we set whenever you hit yes. Mm -hmm. Looking at the starting data set field, which is questions, type of symptom, uh, and the filter type is equals, and the value is LUTs, um, is giving us, okay. Let's go back to the page real quick. So uh, is the, this, this page. Yeah. Can you just like do control F LUTs? Like, sir, I, I just want to find LUTs on this page, L U T S. And is it in every single one of these objects? You there see are three. Three. Yeah, which makes sense because three of these, I mean, maybe makes sense because three of these symptoms that I clicked are LUTs symptoms. Okay. Gotcha. And so we set that value. Okay, so this makes sense. So this is actually what we want. We want LUTs to be in all these, and it looks like that is true based off this glance, right? Yes, yeah. So all three are there, so that makes sense. And then, okay, so let's go back to the flow. So we've confirmed that that works, the first one. Okay. Um, especially if, if you expected three and it looks like that was three at a glance. So now what we would do, oh, like, if go back to like our check response outcome or check for match whatever that whole flow that we have with all these in it mm -hmm. um so the, your first five here just to confirm all you're doing is setting the variable let's true can you look at the next one yes um and it's U U T S. is that what we're seeing it there yeah can you look at the variable for me all the way down yep use okay so all one, two, three, and four are doing is that and mm -hmm. five. Okay. So one, you don't need weights between those five. Oh, okay. Uh, because they're all running independently. There's no consequential logic. So you can just do that. Uh, you might need to wait before between five and six, you need to wait here. So now let me let me see the I want to see the action where you're testing LUTs true. So let's true uh, is there. Uh, it's greater than zero. And okay, let's cop get, just copy this action. Let's go to the other one that we just created. The test flip. And let's paste it in. Uh, no, we still, nope. we just, as long as it's at the end, we don't, we don't care right now. As okay. long as as long as there's a weight between the top one and this one occurring at some point, it's fine. Okay. Um, so we're testing to see if it's the length is greater than zero and then set bit one. Let's now let's click into the set bit one flow. So we're doing lookup code. 
variable value from lookup code. So this is where I'm not 100% sure what you're trying to do. Uh, so I'm just trying to build a, just basically sequentially build a string. So if let's is true, then the first bit is one. And then if the next one is true, then the second bit is one and then so on until right now I've got five potential yeah. groups. You want like a string that represents like every integer and in it represents like some, some one of the mapped values that we're using. Exactly, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, that sounds complicated. Oh, okay. <laughs> it work, but it's probably not the way I would do it uh, <laughs> unless you have a, like a very specific reason for that other than just storing it so you can use it but filter. It, it, what is the reason for that for you? The, uh, it might be a valid reason that I'm not thinking of. Oh yeah, no, the only reason was so that I could just then go to my database with like every single possible outcome and then just say well right right now it's you know this we've got let's true uuts false the other one true the other one true the other one false and then pick that one from the row and then display that particular outcome like I, that I associated in that record right i understand all that part but but uh, either way on the on the opposite side of this you're doing the same thing where you're like you've made this string and then mm -hmm. you're unpacking the string in the same way to get the values that you're actually using to filter, right? I need the string and then I'm unpacking. It. Yes. Okay. So what I would probably do here is I would just have a variable like let's true. Mm -hmm. I would just I, like what I would actually do is just rename let's like outcome equals one, let's outcome equals two. So you're, you're going to have like a, a false and a positive for each of the, like a, a false and a positive flow for each of the checks that you do. Um, so whenever you do the filters, then you do the if thens, mm -hmm. one will be like, like the let's true, like you're gonna have a flow called let's true, and you're gonna just call it like let's filter value one or let's filter value zero or something like that. Okay. Uh, is that making sense? Um, so you're saying rather than having a, string that has all of them uh, key off of each one individually yeah okay. i would have i would have it'll be easier to manage and filter later on because the way that we're going to eventually get the data out is you're going to say like okay i'm going to look up my response from my, my database based off of these and i'm going to filter my let's value by this one my uts one by that variable so you just um, have the variables that will just instantly be the filters that you use for it, instead of having one string that you then have to do all the filtering through. Okay. Okay. So when it's done, presumably if I do it right, I'll have like zero stored in let's true and one stored in let like, UTS true, et cetera, et cetera. And then, exactly. and then I'll, when I want to pull it out of the database, I, I sequentially just filter, I say to, to find the row that I need to be in. Is that Right. Yeah, it'll just be literally like a, whether you, if, you, if you're getting a record, what it probably is too, like you're going to, if you can click on this page to the right of the one that you're on right now, uh, in the studio. So click into the, into the actual canvas. Uh -huh. So that's the actual result page, I assume, that you're going to display. Yeah, some variant of it, yeah. So, so most likely what's going to happen, like after you set all these variables for like let's filter value, UTS filter value, you're going to open a record into this page and you're going to do, do open a record, specific record, and you're going to go from my uh, response template and you're going to filter it by exactly like all four of the, the filter table columns that you have. Okay. You're just filtered by those variables and you're going to open it with a specific record. And then this page is going to open and it's going to, and you're just going to bind it and use it like a, you're just going to use the data directly from that. Uh, okay. I get it now. Okay. So I don't, yeah. So I don't even need to build this string at all because I can just store them all. Yeah, you, variables in the, you know, it could work. I just, it, it's like, I think it's like also harder to manage too because it creates timing issues potentially mm -hmm. without being really specific about your sequencing. Yeah. Uh, and then ultimately you will still, you would still have to then like do a filter value off of that binary, like in some way, shape or form the same way.
Yeah, I was way, like, I wasn't, I was conceptualizing it as it's just one filter. I've got the thing and I go straight to the row, but if you guys already have all the, the filters. Yeah, you'll just, you'll just filter by four fields and it's going to be an and filter by all four fields. Oh. By variable value. Okay. <laughs> each one's going to be mapped to one. It's going to be one action. Like it'll, it, yeah. that part will take you, once you have this set up, that part will take you like five seconds to set up. I did not see this is, yeah. Okay. That says that is, okay, great. See, yeah, just total, total lack of knowledge. All right. All right. Perfect. All right. I'll give that a shot. I really appreciate it. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Th and thanks for staying over. I know you guys are really busy there, so I appreciate it. No, no worries. Anything else? That anyone, any, anyone have any other questions before we, we bounce? Quick one, Josh. Yeah. There is no uh, element that displays an uploaded file, right? Not one to upload a file, but I already captured a file. It's in the collection. If I wanted to either show the name, it's clickable or something, there's no element that does that by itself, is there? So you upload a file uh, and you are saving it to, um, like a, I'm a presuming, presumably they click upload, you hit save, you save it as like a record somewhere. Yes, it saves in, in the data collection as the and whatever. So, you're, so, and so not like something that they're naming the file at that moment, whatever the actual file was, whenever, like the name that came from like- I don't the, know. Yeah, sure. It's like a PDF. So I've uploaded a PDF. I wanna, I wanna make that PDF available for download. So- Would I then just do a text link and make the URL connect to? Yeah, the it would be a text link and the URL would connect to that uh, thing, which you can just store in the database somewhere. The okay. easiest thing I think probably is, I've never done this exactly, but like when you upload it um, to the file uploader, if you go to like, like, you know how like when you go from value to like save it to a record or something where it stores the URL? Yep. Um, when you're opening from value, I think actually if you go to like from like HTML or like, like if you change the middle dropdown from like value to like HTML node or something like that, there might be in that a title of the document that then what okay. I would do is I would save that title in just another yep. field on that same record. So you'd have, yep. the, you'd have the URL and it. And if that's not 100% true, like where there's already like, here's a file name field uh, that you can grab. The most likely thing is you just, you'll, you, can, you can get the string of like the whole thing and you'll just have to like unpack it. Um, there's probably a simple way where we could do that, where it's just like split it at this and then get everything after. And so like, most likely it's a path that just takes a split second to get. Okay, okay. All right, fair enough. Cool, that was it. Cool. Thanks so much new, again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you well, again. Yep. New Thanks. version of Builder coming out.